Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Council and Foundation of St Peter's College and distinguished guests. My name is John Vrodos and I am the school captain here at St Peter's College. On behalf of the Saints community, I would like to welcome you all to our school this evening. I begin by acknowledging that the land that we meet on this evening is the traditional land of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians <coughs> of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. This evening is a unique conversation about wellbeing, as is part of Professor Seligman's time as Adelaide's thinker in residence here in South Australia. Since his visit in 2012, Professor Seligman has interacted and addressed with over 5,000 people at public events, and tonight we add another 1,000 to this tally. Response to this event was swift, with over 300 people on the waiting list. Tonight, we welcome a number of distinguished visitors to the school, including Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Stephen Marshall, State Member for Norwood, Mr Keith Bartley, CEO of the Department for Education and Child Development, and Mrs Bartley, Mr John Higgins, Chairman of Higgins Coatings, Melbourne, Pro Professor Tanya Aspland, University of Adelaide, Associate Professor Lee Waters, University of Melbourne, Dr. Diane Vella Broderick, University of Melbourne, and Ms. Gabrielle Kelly, Director of Adelaide Thinkers in Residence Program. It gives me great pleasure to welcome this evening's panelists who join us for this unique conversation about wellbeing. Professor Martin Seligman, Adelaide's Thinker in Residence, Director of the Positive Psychology, Psychology Centre at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Patrick McGorry, Professor of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne and Director of the Origin Youth Health Centre and 2010 Australian of the Year. Mr Simon, I uh, beg your pardon, Associate Professor Jane Burns, Chief Executive Officer of the Young and Well CRC. Mr Simon Murray, the 14th Headmaster of St Peter's College, current Chair of the Positive Education Schools Association and former Chair of the Association of Heads of Independent Schools of Australia, representing over 390 member schools. And finally, Mr Richard Aidey, an award-winning journalist from ABC Radio National who has agreed to be MC for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the panel to St Peter's College as I pass over to Mr Aidey, who will moderate this evening's panel. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you all of you for coming this evening. It's very warm. Um, we'll try and keep the ideas uh, equally warm, perhaps. We were, we were the, I think the original idea, or certainly one of the original ideas, was to do um, what we'd call a traditional Q&A, um, and we decided not to do that. Partly this is because we couldn't get Malcolm Turnbull or Tanya Plibersek. And, <laughs> It is kind of compulsory to have one of them. <laughs> Partly also, it's because it's complicated to do that format when you're not ranging over um, current affairs issues or, or the agenda, and especially when you're looking at something like wellbeing. Um, however, if you registered for this evening, you will have received an email inviting questions, and some of them will be getting a Guernsey tonight. Uh, not you, that would be me. So we're here to talk about well-being. So let's start with what it is or, or what it's not. It, it's not happiness, it's not sadness, but it's not happiness, Martin. Well, I come from a long tradition of uh, suffering and misery and its relief. Um, and I uh, spent most of my life working on unhappiness and mental illness. And about 15 years ago, I had been brought up in a tradition in which well-being was just the absence of being crazy, the absence of mental illness. And I think what unites the panel tonight is the belief that well-being is something more than just the absence of suffering, unhappiness, alienation, but the presence of something. And that something can be built. So for me, the presence of positive emotion, happiness, the presence of engagement, the presence of good relationships, 
the presence of meaning in life, the presence of accomplishment, or what well-being consists in, and not suffering, not being mentally ill, does not guarantee any of well-being. That's um, Martin referred to those things, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment. You'll hear it called PERMA for short this evening a lot. That's what, that's what people mean when they say, I like to think of it as the woe, what, who, why, and wow. <laughs> Jane, how would you define well-being? Similar sort of thing? Look, I mean, similar to Martin, um, I started my work in resilience 15 years ago and with Diane, who is in the audience um, tonight, and we were looking at young people with chronic illness. And we were asking the question, well, what does resilience look like in young people with chronic illness? And from that original work came the concept that you can actually be well and have a chronic illness or have a disability or have a mental illness. And so the focus then became on, well, what does well-being mean? And it means being able to participate meaningfully. It means being empowered as a young person. It means feeling valued in whatever it might be that you do, regardless of your ability or your disability or your chronic illness or your mental illness. And so wellness for us started to become something that we thought could be and should be achieved by everyone in Australia and all young people. And so I suppose our concepts paralleled your thinking in the US, but we were thinking very much around what does this mean for a flourishing, exciting and wonderful space for young people to spend their time. Pat, you, you come at this from a, a different perspective, which is, well, dealing with younger people who already have problems. Well, I'd say yes and no to that. I think um, what Marty was sort of summing up there, like him, I started off uh, in a very dark place in my career in mental health, um, working with uh, people with schizophrenia back in the 1980s. And, but luckily, we managed to, to focus on young people who were having their first experience of psychotic <coughs> illness. And we, we, we actually had a, um, to try to change the way people thought about their prospects. So, so to try to turn it into a much more positive scenario for them. So that we had to believe in their capacity to recover. And we first of all had to make sure we didn't impede that recovery in any way. And then we gradually became more ambitious, I suppose. And could we actually produce well-being? And we saw so many examples of that happening despite what the textbooks would say. You know? And as Jane said, just because you've got a, a, an ongoing mental illness doesn't mean you can't have a fulfilling and, uh, and, and productive life. And we saw lots of examples of that counter to what all the textbooks would say. And more recently, in the last 10, 15 years, we partnered with Jane and other people to try to extend that thinking to the whole range of mental ill health in young people, but, but also try to change the way people think about it. So I've been very inspired by Marty's work and you know, it's a more radical way of thinking, I think, than, than we've got to, but we want to kind of link up with that and, and try to produce a much more normalised approach to young people and the threats to their mental health, because there are very significant threats to the mental health of young people. It's the most risky period of life for them, but we've got to approach it in this positive way, I think. I, I just want to underscore that. We often think that if we have cancer, psychosis, uh, <clears throat> one illness or another, that somehow that precludes well-being, but it doesn't. Uh, uh, positive emotion, engagement, good relationships, meaning is everyone's <coughs> birthright. Hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I want to ask you a, a different kind of question, which is how rare do you think well-being is? How rare? Or how common, if you prefer. Well, if we look across the boys at Saints and the children in schools, I think that uh, many of those... Year 9 included? Year 9 included. <laughs> just uh, they just might, checking. They might be prickly, but uh, no, lots of nice young men in Year 9. But uh, look, I think that the, that the state of well-being amongst boys in a school like this is, is pretty good. That. Uh, these are boys that uh, are well grounded and I, and I don't think it's much different uh, to similar schools around the nation. That, uh, now that might not be the case in all schools, mm. but uh, when a school has good pastoral structures in place and good support and uh, here a commitment to do all we can to help the well, boys I'll flourish. I'll come back again to, do, to talk about that in more detail. 
a bit later, but there is a question already uh, from the audience. Samantha, if you're here, um, don't stand up because I'm going to read it out. It says, does one need adversity to build strength? What do you think, Martin? It seems it's, it's slightly outside the paradigm, but it's, it's a question that a lot of people would have, I think. What, what Nietzsche said, if it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger, is very often true. That is, the phenomenon of post-traumatic growth, I think, is even more common than the phenomenon of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so the question is, must we go through hmm. adversity in order to grow? And I think we, we, just, we just don't know, since it, um, uh, we don't have uh, lives in which minimal adversity and then growth. And when we think of uh, great men and women, uh, we often think of the adversities that happen to them as young people, and we think of them as catalytic. But we're dealing with uh, really the unknown here. Actually, we, we tend to think of great men and women in the, in the circumstances they find themselves, which are always adverse. If that, that, that's how we define greatness, in a way. Right, but interestingly, uh, um, there are people here in the audience who know more about botany than I do, but as far as I know, when you look at growth of plants, that trauma for a plant while young is really a bad thing. Uh, and it's not as if you get better grapes or better apples by traumatizing them as, as uh, uh, young ones. So I think there's, there's something fiddly you can do with grapes, question. I think. Uh, Pat, can I ask you, this, one, this one's from Hugh, and Hugh says, do you believe that our individual personality type has a bearing on our happiness, and that if we know and understand what that is, the personality type, we can work on it and influence our well-being. Well, perhaps I, I can keep going with the uh, bot botanical uh, yeah. analogies here. As, as Marty was talking, I was thinking, um, I, I read, uh, it was actually a literature on resilience, which Jane's already mentioned, and, and uh, I think it was a Swedish idea. It, it, it may not be that complicated, but they talked about two different types of plants, um, one being a dandelion and another being an orchid. And uh, depending on, on, on uh, you know, um, a dandelion is very invulnerable to, to trauma and stress. Um, you, can, you can pour weed killer on it and it won't die and that kind of stuff. And, but an orchid is very sensitive to environmental stress. But to really flower, it needs the right conditions. And, and I, I think that's probably true of, of most people, to really flourish sorry to borrow your term, but, but to flourish, you probably need the gene environment interaction. You need the right environment and, and probably a certain amount of challenge at certain times. Um, I, I mean, you wouldn't wish severe trauma on, any, on anybody, you know, but on the other hand, um, I think it's the inter interaction and also the, the types of vulnerability we have. Um, but to produce a beautiful orchid, you need exactly the right conditions. If, if I could just add to that, um, I spent the first 20 years of my research working on something called learned helplessness. And uh, what I tried to sweep under the rug was when we brought people to the laboratory and gave them unsolvable problems, two-thirds of them became helpless, but one-third didn't. I couldn't, couldn't make them helpless you in couldn't the break laboratory. Them. <laughs> you couldn't make them helpless. And that's what led to positive psychology, because I began to ask, what was it about the one-third, their personality, that made them invulnerable from helplessness. And it turned out it was the optimists who I couldn't make helpless. I think those two answers are, are both very interesting, but in no way do they answer Hugh's question. I'll, I'll, put it to you. I'll put it to you, Jane. Do you think that our individual personality type, I'm going to paraphrase you here, that our individual personality type has a bearing on it? So if we know and understand what it is, and, and I know it's, you know, you can't say, well, you're fabulous, that's your personality type. We can work on it, and, and that will influence our well-being. Surely a bit of self-knowledge. It sounds like think, a good idea. I think the simple answer, which is never simple, is that it's complex, and it is one tiny piece of the puzzle. And I think, to, to, be, to be fair to adversity, um, when we talk about adversity, we're talking about a major catastrophic life event. But when you think about the transition from childhood into adolescence, and then into adolescence into young adulthood, that is quite an adverse experience. You experience a shift from relying on your mum and dad to um, searching for your own sense of autonomy. For some young people, they may not fit in. They experience bullying and victimisation, um, exam stress. It is quite an adverse time in that transition across life. So can you build resilience from everyday life 
adversity? Mm -hmm. I think absolutely the answer is yes. And this came from my original work where we were looking at rudder and sort of saying, does it need to be a catastrophic adverse event? No, it doesn't. You can learn skills that, that enable you to survive, thrive and flourish and do well. And you can, independent of your personality, you can be well. And I believe that every person has the capacity to be well, regardless of what their adversity might have been, or not. <laughs> um, Martin, you're, you're a visitor, you're, but you're, you've been here a lot. You've been to Australia quite a few times. So you can get a perspective on this, I think. Are we different to other countries in terms of um, the challenges of how we engage with well-being in this country? Are we, are we further behind? Are we further ahead? Have we got more to do? Uh, Richard, I didn't hear half of it. Uh, Sorry, I'm try, trying to do an Australian look. I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, try, <laughs> I'm trying to cast it in terms of, I suppose, the challenges facing the country when it comes to well-being. And I'm wondering, given your perspective as somebody who visits but has visited a lot, where we are, where we compare to, compared to, say, America? Um, well, when, when we ask the question of comparative well-being, uh, we have good statistics now for Europe, in fact, for European adults. So uh, about 35% of adult Danes are flourishing by the PERMA criteria, but only about 18% of Brits and about 5% of Russians. So in, in uh, huge differences mm -hmm. in the European Union. So the question is uh, really my impressions of Australia mm. and, and uh, South Australia in particular. And if, um, my impression is that it's more like Denmark than like Russia. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, now uh, Matthew White and Saints will actually be gathering with, with Lee uh, statistics on what is the percentage of, of, of boys at uh, saints that are flourishing. But again, from spending now probably a total of six weeks on this campus, and I spend a lot of time at schools, it is a remarkable high level of well-being, I think. Uh, it's my guess. Patrick, you spend a lot of time engaging with policymakers, and well, there's only so much money, I don't have to tell you that, it's a very rare politicians, and present politicians excluded, uh, who says, surely I can give you more, Patrick. <laughs> How much of the mental health budget should be going into well-being? I think, um, yeah, that's a very good question. I might throw that one back to Martin. But, um, <laughs> but, 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 but in, ter in terms of I actually, thought it would be interesting to ask Pat that question. I, I think there's a huge appetite potentially in, in our political leaders and some of our political leaders to, to recognise that, um, that this is a, a hugely neglected issue both on both sides of the coin, mental ill health, mental illness. I mean, just to give you some figures, we, we spend about 6% of our health budget on, on mental health care in Australia. It's at least 13 to 14% of the burden of disease you know, across the lifespan. Um, we're underfunding it by 50% and the consequences are all around us. Now that hasn't been brought, I don't think, to policymakers' attention by, enough by the public. So it's great to see 1,100 people in this room tonight um, to, to actually show the public's interest. When the public rise up and express their interest, that's when you see the leadership in, in, amongst uh, our politicians being empowered to do something about it. I think a lot of them do want to. I spent yesterday in Parliament House in Canberra. And I think every single person I met amongst the political leadership wants this issue to be addressed, but they, they can't really you know, get support within their parties to do it until the public demonstrate that they care enough about it. So, and that would be true for well-being as, as much as, as for, for addressing the healthcare issues of people with mental ill health. So that's what I've learned. The public have got to be mobilised and have got to continue to be mobilised because last year we saw $2 billion allegedly put into, into mental health federally. Hardly any of it's been spent. And um, that's because the public haven't sort of insisted on accountability for that. I, I, I'd like to comment as well, if I might, about budgets. Uh, Bertrand, Bertrand Russell, uh, this is the difference between 
therapy and prevention. Yes. And Bertrand Russell s s said the mark of a civilized human being was the ability to read a column of numbers and then weep. And, and this is the therapy prevention issue. So I was at a remarkable meeting about four years ago of the, uh, the general staff of the United States Army. The Surgeon General said the following. Uh, in the United States, we spend $2 trillion on health care. 1.5 trillion, 75%, goes to treating people my age and almost Patrick's age. Uh, uh, <laughs> civilian medicine and allocation of resources is perversely incentivized. It's incentivized by illness. Whereas army medicine, he then went on to say, is rationally incentivized. What you want to do is take these 18-year-olds and make them really healthy, and then they'll do their job better. And all of us know that if the dollars were allocated back there, rather than to me and to Patrick, there's much more bang for the buck. That's where our leverage is. Can we say, then, that if you inculcate well-being, that that has a protective effect, that it means you're less likely to develop a mental illness later. Can we definitely say that? Well, the, it's a promissory note. There is good evidence. When, when I first started doing positive psychology and was asking actually budgetary questions, that is, where am I going to get the money for the research, um, the most natural thing was to say, well, we can do it to prevent the illnesses. But I, I chose not to do it that way. I, I believe that well-being is every human being's right and that we want it regardless. As a secondary effect, there is mounting evidence that it uh, decreases the probability of heart disease, of stroke, and of mental illness. And I think that's what unites us is the hope that by building the well-being of young people will not only increase well-being, but will decrease the worst stuff in life. Could I just jump in there quickly? I was going to get to that side at some point, but okay, go, go on. Sorry. I would just want to support that. And, and I say we should support well-being in it, on its own terms and on its own merits, as, as Marty said. But I also think we've got to, we've got to do something about mental, mental health care. In it. And again, the same argument that Marty used. Um, obviously, we, what, we need to look after people who have already ended up in, in a disabled sort of state. But we've got to actually invest in the age group that bears the full brunt of the onset of these mental health problems. And that's the whole argument about youth mental health in Australia, which we actually are starting to build. And so I think they're very compatible, as, as Marty's saying. Jane, should we, spend, should we be spending real money, which I don't think we are at the moment, from the public health budget on wellbeing? Yes. How much of it? My, my view is absolutely consistent with um, Pat and Marty. It's not an either or, and it is about how do you invest in the wellness of all people, and that is much more cost effective than trying to pick up the pieces when someone um, ends up in the system. But by the same token, people are ending up in the system and our system is failing those people. And as a result of our system failing, they are sicker for longer and the cost is, is, is drawn out further. So the question for government and, and the potential solution to it is to wrap this together and have wellness promotion across schools, across workplaces, mm -hmm that are really focused on how do you create um, towns and, and states and, and a country that is about the promotion of wellness, but also make sure that you've got your services set up so that they're supportive of young people, that they are ensuring that they're, they're getting the right treatment at the right time. And if you've got your wellness right, they won't be in treatment for as long. Um, they will be able to be a contributing member of society, they will be able to work, they will be able to come to school. Yeah. So the question shouldn't be an either or or how much should we invest here or there, it should be what realistically do we as a country need to invest so that we can be the best country we possibly can be. But it's, 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 even if we do that, it's going to be hard, isn't it? Like, there have been successive government campaigns, for example, to attend to our physical well-being. And we're rubbish at it. We're getting fatter and fatter and, and, and in many ways less healthy. Um, why do you think that well-being, which is just like exercise, it's, it's not like you can say, oh, I went off and did this well-being course, I've got well-being, I should be fine now for the rest of my life. It's not going to work that way. It's going to be a lifestyle. It's going to be what you do all the time. 
What do you think the government's chances are, even if it said, we're going to take this really seriously, of actually persuading us to do it? Well, <laughs> I think, do you want to start the... Jane, I'll certainly jump in there. That uh, I think the, the pushes coming from parents who uh, uh, traditionally were interested in numeracy and literacy, what are we doing for children at school in terms of what they learn uh, in, and understand in terms of knowledge, I think there's a push there from parents wanting schools to invest in, the, in what are we doing about uh, the well-being of the children at the school. So the shift from pastoral care, how do we nurture them, uh, to a shift of what are, you, what are you doing for my child to help him have a, or her, have a successful and flourishing life beyond school. Well, what are, what are you doing? What are we doing? You're doing a lot, aren't you? Investing heavily in it. We're doing a lot of thinking, a lot of learning, a lot of planning, and a lot of implementation, and a lot of sharing uh, with, uh, in this space. And uh, um, clearly, uh, that, that's driven from a policy decision. So if we look at uh, a school council as a, a small subset of uh, government policy, for example, we have a council at school who believes that money should be invested in uh, well-being as it ought to be invested in the, uh, the, 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 the formal academic program. And so, I, I'd like to reinforce what Simon is saying. Even from a very, if all you cared about in education was traditional reading, writing, numeracy and the like, it turns out that when kids have well-being, they do better at that. So indeed, if our only goal was the traditional goals, we didn't care at all about well-being in its own right or its effects on, on mental illness or mental health. Uh, well-being turns out to be synergistic with traditional learning, not antagonistic. We're, we're actually being quite crass about it and saying if you can link it to productivity, yep. so your students do better at school, your um, employees do better at work, they are present, they're there, they are um, performing, they're productive, then it's worth the investment. Now, it takes time, and I think this was a conversation that we'd had earlier. It doesn't just happen. You don't just immediately invest in wellbeing and everyone's There's no made. pill. There's because, no magic pill. Yes. There are ways and means of creating greater engagement, creating greater scaffolding around it, creating more conversations around it that actually will create a community response that's not just a school taking responsibility, it's not just a family taking responsibility, it's actually holistically how do we join the dots and get workplaces involved, how do we involve all schools, how do we ensure that towns think about mm. what it means to be well. Simon, you, you, you've done the workplace bit, haven't you? It's, this is not purely about the students. No, I think you have to begin with, with the staff and uh, invest in building their capability uh, investing in their well-being, help the staff to flourish is, is the starting point and then uh, uh, look to help those staff, uh, help the boys, the students to flourish. And uh, that's what we've done. We've trained 150 staff at Saints. We've got that critical mass. The conversations are changing and the work we can do with the boys is changing. I've got a question here from John who emailed it in earlier. He says, as a teacher, I often see students change as they get older from bright and enthusiastic young learners to, to more jaded and often negative teens who project as being disengaged. Is this mindset a product of the pressures facing young teens as they adjust from childhood to adolescence and young adulthood? In these situations, it is the power of the peer group which dominates individuals. How do you see the psychology of positive education breaching the defences of the teen mob? I think we've got to begin by saying that not all children are like that. Uh, um, so, so some uh, uh, don't fit that uh, no. stereotype. But uh, I, I think it's giving children an understanding, a better understanding about themselves, an understanding of what their own strengths are. And uh, I think that uh, using the uh, positive psychology, there's a clear entree into that. So uh, know thyself, know what one's strengths are, and then you scaffold it with uh, programs which uh, using principles of positive psychology which will build resilience. And so uh, when they are in that, uh, under the pressure of peers and so mm. forth, 
They've got greater insight to themselves. You've, you've, you've um, helped develop their, their resilience, their capacity to make meaning, uh, build positive relationships. So positive psych will give them a kit bag of uh, tools to help navigate through those choppy waters. If, if, if I may add to that, um, what do we want to know about thyself? And the tradition that I grew up in in education when I was a kid 60 years ago was know the bad things about yourself. Know about your weaknesses, <coughs> correct your weaknesses. And I think what's going on, what Simon is leading um, here at Saints is when we know thyself, let's know about our strengths. Let's find out what we're really good at and let's build our lives around those and use those to buffer our weaknesses. So it's a non-remedial view of education. I also have a view about involve young people in solutions, um, build on their strengths. Um, the boys here are, are involved in embedding the positive psychology into the culture of the school. And that is about respectful relationships, acceptance of diversity, feeling valued and being able to participate. Now, of course, young people are going to go through ups and downs and there is going to be someone who's unhappy and disgruntled and it's not all happy clappy and I think we need to be clear on that. Mm. But if you've got a supportive environment that's supported with the boys taking on their responsibility with the school, the staff, the parents involved in it, that then becomes a part of your embedded culture. Should it be in every school? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Will yes. be. And, and, oh, my view is yes. I, I mean, mean I, I think it's a no-brainer. Keith Bartley sitting here and uh, <laughs> uh, Chief Executive of the uh, Education Child Development right across South Australia, uh, wanting to embed it. Uh, there's, there's a commitment uh, with Martin's support to develop a measure of well-being for every child in South Australia. So literacy and numeracy and various other things we can all agree on should be in schools. We're now saying well-being should be in schools too. Well it is in schools and uh, the tsunami has arrived. Uh, this is not going away and that's why uh, Stephen Marshall is sitting here listening because uh, he's I'm, going to embed it in He's policy. going to embed it. <laughs> Just, I, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering, Simon, if you should be careful what you wish for because <laughs> if, if it's a core component of what is done in schools, isn't there a danger that we'll start to grade it and we'll start to assess how well schools do it and then we'll put it on the My School website? Yeah, watch this space. Um, look, I hope not. I, I really hope we don't give it a mark. Uh, I mean, we, we tried. That, that would be bad. To, to find that you're failing well-being would... <laughs> <coughs> on the left-hand side of the report, you wouldn't be happy about that. But we can <laughs> absolutely. But there's a language we can use around it. The to evidence. report on the left-hand exactly. side of the report. And card. I think the evidence is very clear that uh, it, when you talk about bullying, if you can actually, as a school, look at your level of bullying in a school and respond to it with your policies and your, your, your um, activities, then you've got a benchmark against which you can measure. And if, if you can do it in a strengths-based way, so it's not a, oh, you're a terrible well-being school, you're down here, mm. but if you can actually all aspire to be there, then that's a good So you'd, you'd, have it, you'd have it on my school? Bring it. I don't know that I'd have it on my school, but I would certainly be using the data to support the work that you're doing. Because how else you going to measure what you're doing? Well, this is the challenge of, of scaling things up. You know, things that we know work that have been pioneered, you know, innovations create creative uh, steps forward. How, how do you get the things that work in, into the real world in everyone's experience? So it's great to hear of those, those sort of ideas and plans mm. to, to scale it up in South Australia. Uh, obviously, we've been trying to do that with Headspace nationally. And you know, it's going quite well because once something does work, people want it. And I think I'll, I'll come back to a question that you asked Marty before and maybe ask him to talk a little bit more about this, which is, is it, would it be a, um, a, a self-fulfilling sort of process? If you, because people want to feel good. People want, it's a very powerful driver, isn't it? W that feeling of well-being po and that positive emotion. And, but you were saying also that, um, you know, people have got a tendency to, f to focus on the negative uh, as well. So. Um, could, it, could, could the driver be people themselves uh, in the scaling up process? Well, I, th I think there, there may be two interesting drivers. So uh, both you and I have spent a lot of our lives being 
therapists. And um, uh, one of the dirty little secrets of therapy is that um, you're working on people's weaknesses and it's really not a lot of fun to diet and keep turning down chocolate mousse and work on, on your weaknesses. And in fact, a lot of our therapeutic stuff melts after we stop doing therapy. So one driver turns out to be the positive interventions, um, things like using your highest strength at work, uh, kindness, for example. It's um, self-reinforcing, feels good to do, mm. becomes addictive. That's one driver. And there's one more to be said that, that I, I, I think Patrick may be the most powerful of all, and I'm going to call it the invisible hand of measurement. So once you change, once you... You can't do the right thing unless you measure the right thing. Once you decide that well-being is a societal good and you measure it, and you, Simon says we want more of it in school, CEOs say we want more of it in a corporation, then people start to find local ways of increasing it. So if you think about your marriage uh, and you think your job is uh, the well-being of your spouse, that she should have more positive emotion and more engagement. Merely setting that as a goal creates local interventions that you build to increase it. So I think those are, there's an invisible hand driver mm. and a measurement driver. I've got, I've got a question. I'm, I'm not sure whether it should be for you, Simon, or for you, Martin, because it comes from Elizabeth, and she says, if I could go back to my primary school principal tomorrow with one idea or suggestion, that would impact on the positive well-being of the students at the school, what would it be? I think we should both answer it, because it's going to be interesting. But Just one at a time, because it would be very difficult to follow. Uh, <laughs> my idea was start engagement. Uh, go back, form an interest group, start the learning, learn about it. Uh, create a coalition of the willing uh, that uh, are interested in well-being. What's the research showing? What's the literature that's there? create strategic partnerships, and, and from that, that humble beginning of, of engagement, then start the planning. And uh, how do you embed it into the fabric of the school? It's not an add-on. It needs to be embedded right across the... Uh, in the, the culture. In the culture of the school and the strategic uh, intent of the school. And uh, then you can get to the stages of implementation. So. You don't start with implementation, you start with learning, and there's various ways to do that, and then you do the planning, mm. uh, and then you implement. Um, it's a great question, and I look at Simon and I think about my headmaster, Harry Meislon, and what I, what I, if I could tell him now what he should have done. <laughs> I, I think I know. A, this is a family audience, just bear well, that it, in. <laughs> it, it comes from our research at West Point. So uh, West Point is very concerned about measuring leadership. So it asks what single characteristic is the best predictor of leadership ratings? And it's the capacity to love and be loved in the military, of all things. And so what I would say to Harry, if I could speak to him today, was build love, Harry. Build love. That's a great, a great thing to say. I want to move on to technology because it is so pervasive in the lives of, of all of us, but especially children and adolescents. Jane Burns, you're running the, the CRC for Young People, Technology and Wellbeing. So the next question, which comes from Walter, I'll put to you. He says, we're all aware that digital natives see technology as an intrinsic part of their lives, in some ways even part of their minds and bodies. What role do you think technology plays in the well-being of young people today? I think given that technologies are pervasive, and we've just um, done our survey of 1,400 young people across Australia, 99% of young Australians are using technologies. Our challenge is to look at the evidence that we've got for the past 20 years of positive psychology and wellbeing research and resilience research, and actually think about how we can take that into the online environment. And when you talk about the cost of delivering these types of interventions, I think the technologies themselves provide us with an avenue and a way of engaging with young people in a way that we've never been able to do before. 
in a way that we can actually provide all of the concepts, positive relationships, feeling valued, being able to participate, acceptance of diversity, and we can do that through digital content creation. We can do that through online wellbeing centres where we can actually have apps that young people can download around um, looking after themselves, around their resilience, around the things that we know are actually good for you like diet and sleep and exercise. So you can get an app to help you monitor your mood. How are you going? You can. Now if you could tie that to your wellbeing plan, so you've created a wellbeing plan with your school and you could actually follow real time, on your phone, how you're going. The potential of that technology is absolutely mind-boggling. And the capacity to reach not only those young people who are in our major cities, but those young people in our regional, rural, remote communities is absolutely fundamentally about shifting the disparities in what we've been able to provide to people and really think about how do we take this amazing work and make it available to all Australians. It's, it's a different way of thinking about it, isn't it? Because mm. I think a lot of parents, I speak as a parent, are concerned with how much time their children spend in front of screens, engaged by screens. And, and it's easy to feel just intuitively that they should be outside running around. Easy answer, balance. Now, again, the National Survey, so we started in 2007, um, measured young people. Now in 2013 we've looked at it again. Now mental illness, which we measured um, using a psych measurement, the K10, which you will well know, the mental health of young Australians hasn't moved at all. It's one in four. So it's a, it's a very scary stat for us. What has increased though is the use of technology. So what we're seeing is that the technologies aren't actually increasing the amount of um, mental ill health. So that's, that's the good news about it. What we are seeing, however, is that there is an increase in the amount of time that young people are spending online and those that are on after 11 o'clock at night. And for us who work in mental health, that raises some, some big warning bills. So our answer back to parents and to our service providers is technology is here. Um, young people have embraced it. It's not going to go away. And just putting in place rules and regulations is not going to solve that problem. What we're doing with our young people is saying, how can you educate us about how you're using those technologies and how can we work with you to help parents understand how to put in place some parameters around that technology use? So simple rules like turning the phone off after 10 o'clock at night, not having access to a computer after 10 o'clock at night. Simple things that you can put in place as a parent which are about respecting those parameters and those sense of autonomy so that as young people get older, they can actually make their own decisions and use the technologies in the ways that we want them to, which is about engagement. Patrick, do when young people are, because you, 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 a big thing of yours is to intervene before people get really ill. When people might get ill, do can we say if they tend to use technology more or? Uh, <clears throat> that's something that we're working with Jane and, and the, the, we're part of the, the CRC that Jane leads as well at, um, and we also have um, internet based sort of research happening as well but I don't think we can, we can answer that chicken and egg question yeah. just yet. Um, it's probably a bit of both I, I would say but I think picking the positive psychology theme and Jane's really exemplified this, we've got to try to work out positive ways to address this real change in the way you know, life is lived and we can't just, I don't think these controls uh, that everyone talks about and even, even the things that you just said, I think they're a little bit unrealistic with kids of my own, um, you know, um, I think we've got to work out with them in partnership what, what a reasonable way is to behave and, and to operate in that environment and, and as everyone knows the internet Governments are finding this too, um, um, you know, um, Julian Assange, I mean, it's very, very difficult to control things on the internet. Uh, the Chinese government might be able to do it, but... Um, so I, I think that's the wrong mindset. I think the mindset that we're talking about tonight is how, do we can, how can we turn this into a positive, which I, Jane's been talking about that for years. Um, Martin, I want to talk about the outcomes of you being Adelaide's thinker in residence. Um, I know you're making three recommendations. The first one is about measurement. We've already touched on measurement this evening. What is it that you want to do with measurement? Sorry, Richard, you have to I'm sorry. say this to me again. <laughs> Wait, I, I'm asking about your recommendations to come out of the Thinker in Residence program. One of them is about measurement. Now, we have touched on measurement. 
But what is it specifically you, you, you are recommending we do with measurement? Um, well, as I said before, it, it, you have to measure the right thing to do the right thing. So uh, South Australia, uh, being led by uh, Gabe Kelly, the Prime Minister, uh, the Cabinet is talking about the possibility of measuring the well-being, the PERMA, of every young person in South Australia. And then what follows from measurement is you can, as Mr. Cameron's done in England, you hold yourself accountable for the success or failure of public policy, not by changes in GDP, but by changes in well-being. So the very first step of knowing what people's well-being are, knowing what young people's well-being is, gives you the baseline against which to measure public policy. It actually has radical implications, very radical implications. Well, oh, I think, the, I think this is radical. I think it's, it's, it, it's the move from thinking that the bottom line of good government is money to thinking the bottom line of good government is well-being. So the movement from saying what we're going to measure is GDP and policy works if it increases GDP uh, turned out increasing wealth uh, uh, up to a point increases well-being with very rapidly diminishing returns. So I think we're entering an era in which we're saying that the point of money, the point of wealth, is not more wealth. The point is more well-being. So we, and that starts with measurement. We move from GDP to GWI, Gross Wellbeing Index, or something like that. Uh, it's not as fanciful as it sounds. So uh, if we had been having this panel 30 years ago, and I said, I been let's not measure sure. positive emotion or engagement or good relationships, it would have been ridiculous. We didn't have measures of that. But what's happened in the last 15 years, in the same way we can measure the amount of psychosis, the amount of alcoholism, we can measure people's engagement at school. We can measure how good their relationships are, how much meaning they have. And therefore, since we have measurement of well-being, we can build pu public policy and education around well-being. Marty, what, what would you say about this statistic? This was published last September. The World Economic Forum published a, a report um, showing that the biggest threat to GDP by 2030 is going to be mental ill health alongside cardiovascular disease. So mental ill health is equal first as a threat. To, I know it's, it's not the same argument. You're, you're still saying GDP is important, which is not what you're saying. But I think the two things are actually yeah. quite intimately yeah. related. And I think it? if all we cared about was GDP, we should still be enormously interested in increasing well-being. Yeah. Because on the illness side, mental illness is a huge GDP cost. Mm. And on the positive side, low morale, low well-being is an mm. enormous mm. productivity mm. course. Mm. So if all we cared about was money, well-being would still be of great interest. Right. Another recommendation is on um, the introduction of scalable interventions. What are you talking about there? Um, well, I, I've spent a lot of the last 10 years asking, are there interventions that you can use in schools, in the military, in a community to increase permit, to increase uh, well-being? And there are about 10 of them. And in my real life, what I go through is we try to opt we try to take interventions, put them on the web, and measure against placebo controls whether or not they work. Um, but I'm kind of fed up. And let me tell you why I'm fed up. I think that well, increased well-being is going to be local. It's going to not come from these uh, interventions like uh, uh, before you go to sleep at night, write down three things that went well. It's going to come from people in local situations, in the clinic, in marriage, in schools, saying, gee, if my goal as an educator or as a husband is to increase well-being of my wife, of my people, what would I do? And those, I think, are, are local. So I'm, I'm after throwing the question of intervention right back to all of us. The third recommendation is about, it's about ambition, ambition for Adelaide. What do you want Adelaide to become? Well, let's see, I, uh, I've, 
People say to me sometimes, Adelaide is boring. Well, I'm uh, from Sydney and we never say that, do we? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the Lord Mayor said to me, I don't know if Stephen is here last year, Adelaide's the only great city in the world that nothing really bad has ever happened to. Well, I think we can do a lot more than that. That's not. I don't think Adelaide is boring, by the way. So I've had a, my two months here have been exciting and wonderful. But um, Adelaide's got a real edge, and that is it's at the center of a political, educational, corporate, mental health movement that's saying let's put well-being at the center. Now, uh, if South Australia is going to measure the well-being of everyone, do interventions to build it, in, in the 15th century, uh, all the artists wanted to go move to Florence because that's where the action was about beauty. So imagine that the icon for Adelaide is not a building like the Opera House, but rather the world center of well-being. A Florentine moment. Yeah. <laughs> On the torrents. You would, you would actually have to build a centre too, though. You would, it wouldn't be enough to have, uh, to have lots of conferences. You'd have to have a centre for training and research. You know, think of it as Florence, that, that you attract... The, there are people in politics, the film, psychology, psychiatry, economics, who have, have a part of this question of building well-being. What if Adelaide were the magnet? What if that's where they wanted to come? Because that's where the other people doing it were. So can Adelaide create the infrastructure to be the magnet for the well-being of the world? What response have you had from the state government? Um, well, I think the, this originated in a, a cabinet meeting with the uh, premier and his cabinet. And uh, at the end of going through my first two recommendation, uh, recommendations, um, uh, Mr. Witherell said, well, we've got an inferiority complex here. We're, we're constantly comparing ourselves to Sydney and Melbourne. What do you think we should do? And that's, so the origin of this is in government. Watch this space. Ladies and gentlemen, I am acutely conscious that um, it's now about 8.30 and it's warm. So can I ask you to thank our panel, Martin Seligman, Pat McGorry, Jane Burns and Simon Murray. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us at St Peter's College this evening. I am sure that you have found the panel here at Saints an informative, thought-provoking and at times challenging. It gives me great pleasure on behalf of St Peter's College to thank our panellists for joining us this evening. Professor McGorry, Professor Burns, Mr Aidy each flew across to Saints today to be especially with us. I also would like to thank the Headmaster and Professor Seligman for their contribution. I now ask Tom McNeil, our School Vice-Captain, to present each of our guest panellists with a gift on behalf of St Peter's College. <laughs>